Okay, so the first source of discrimination we want to think about is discrimination against certain kinds of employees by employers. So we might think about this, for example, as there being two types of workers, right? White workers and non-white workers, let's say. And employers have some preferences that lead them to prefer white workers to non-white workers. So one way to think about this is we could think about employers as having some distaste towards hiring non-white workers. So when they hire a white worker, their costs for doing so are just going to be the wage that they pay that white worker. But when they hire a non-white worker, they're going to feel as though they pay both a wage to that non-white worker and they pay some psychic or psychological cost. Um, that they have some level of distaste towards non-white workers that comes into their decision as an extra economic cost. In other words, the cost of hiring a white worker some CW is just the wage you pay that white worker. The cost of hiring a non-white worker is the CW or CNW is the wage that you pay that worker plus this D, where this D is some discrimination coefficient or level of distaste or something like that. And on top of this, let's imagine a world, let's think about a, a context in which other than the fact that non-white workers are discriminated against, there are no differences whatsoever between white workers and non-white workers. In other words, white workers and non-white workers are perfect substitutes and they have exactly the same level of productivity. So the firm's production is going to be given by, you know, Q is going to be some F of white labor, LW, and non-white labor, LNW. And that's just going to be some function of these two things added together, right? Like, so for an example, right, we could have Q equal something like two times right, LW plus LNW to the one half, right? So what we're saying here is that from the point of view of production, a white worker factors into our production in exactly the same way as a non-white worker. Okay, great. So given this, let's think about what the firm is going to choose to do, who the firm is going to choose to hire for different wages paid to white workers and paid to non-white workers. So how are they going to choose who to hire? Well, we know that they're going to try to maximize their perceived profits. In other words, they're going to maximize the difference between their revenue and what they see as the cost of their employees. And in order to maximize profits, we know that we have to minimize costs, which means we're going to have to figure out essentially the, the cheapest point on each ISO point that we can produce at. Right? So if we've got some graph here where we've got number of white workers, LW and non-white LNW, right? What we need to do is we need to say, well, what does the isoquant look like? And based on that, how are we going to choose our optimal number of workers? Well, because we know that white and non-white workers are perfect substitutes who are exactly as productive, we know that our isoquant is just going to be a straight line with a slope of negative 1. Right, so 10 white workers are exactly as productive as 10 non-white workers, as are any combinations in between, right? One non-white worker and nine white workers, etc. And how do we know this? We know this has to be the case because when we calculate our marginal rate of technical substitution, this is going to come right out of the chain rule, right? So we'll say MRTS is going to equal... DF, D, L, N, W over DF, D, L, W, right? And we know, just to remind you, that F of L, N, W, L, W is just some little F of the two added together, right? So this is just going to be F prime times the derivative of the inside with respect to LNW, which is 1, 
So this is going to be f prime over f prime, right? They enter exactly the same way. So our MRTS is just one. This is just another way of saying we can always substitute one white worker for one non-white worker and produce the exact same amount of output. Okay, so given that, our optimal choice is either going to be to hire all white workers or all non-white workers. Right? If we had an ISO cost curves that look like this, where this is the direction of lower cost, our cheapest possible option would be to hire only white workers, right? On the other hand, if we had ISO cost curves that look like this, our cheapest option would be to hire only non-white workers, right? So we're going to be at a corner solution. So what's this going to tell us? It's going to tell us that essentially if the cost ratio is greater than the, than the MRTS, right? So if we've got Right, the slope of our ISO cost curves is going to be the ratio of the cost of a non-white worker to the cost of a white worker. If this thing is greater than 1, in other words, if WNW plus D is greater than W white, then we'll hire all white workers. If they're equal, then we'll hire both, and if we perceive non-white workers as cheaper than white workers, after accounting for our distaste, then we'll hire, or the employer's distaste, I don't want to implicate ourselves here, then we'll hire all non-white. Right, so what we're saying is because of the fact that white and non-white workers are perfect substitutes, um, it's only going to make sense for us to hire both types of workers in the case that the ratio of costs is exactly the same as the ratio of productivity. In other words, if white and non-white workers cost us exactly the same amount, right? Otherwise, we go with whoever we perceive is cheaper. So if, we, if the wage gap between white and non-white workers is not, is not large enough, or yeah, is not large enough to justify our feelings of discrimination or prejudice towards non-white workers, we'll only hire white workers. If the wage gap is so large that we're willing to accept our, our prejudice, right, relative to our level of prejudice, we'll hire only non-white workers. Okay, does this make sense? Great. Okay, so this is going to tell us what each individual firm is going to do. What we want to do now is we want to think about, now that we know the decision of each employer or each firm, what's going to happen in the market equilibrium, right? What's going to, what are we going to learn from this about what the wage difference between white and non-white workers are, is? And let's start by thinking about this in a context where all employers are identical, right? So they all have exactly the same value of distaste D. Well, what we're going to learn from this is if, employ, if the wage gap was smaller than D, Right? In other words, if we had D greater than the wage gap, then we wouldn't hire any non-white workers. If we had D smaller than the wage gap, we, would, we wouldn't hire any white workers. So we must have, if everybody's going to be employed, if we're going to have employed white and non-white workers, we're going to have to have the wage gap, the wage difference between white and non-white workers, be exactly equal to that level of discrimination. Right? If we had any other wage gap, we would have um, some kind of workers be completely unemployed. Okay. Okay, so let's think through this labor market equilibrium in the case where we've got the supply of white and non-white workers that's completely identical. So let's think about supply and demand in this market. All right, so we'll have our wage rate here and we'll have L here. And we'll start by saying we've got a labor supply 
of white workers that's exactly the same as the labor supply of non-white workers. Right? So far, so good. However, from the perspective of employers, right, the cost of a non-white worker is going to be W plus D. So if we thought about the labor supply of non-white workers as a function of their perceived cost to employers, employers are going to act as if non-white workers are actually a little bit more expensive than this, right? Or that they're supplying less labor at a particular cost. So we have some labor supply of non-white workers. of C, which is going to be their labor supply of W minus D. E. Right? So from the perspective of employers, non-white workers look a little bit more expensive than they actually are. And as a result of that, we're going to have a total labor supply curve, right, that's just equal to the supply of white workers up until we get past this gap D. This gap, by the way, is going to be D. And then it's going to become less steep because it's going to be the sum of the supply of white workers and the supply of non-white workers. All this labor supply total at some cost, right? OK, great. And then, of course, we'll have labor demand. Right, based on perceived cost of workers, and we'll have some equilibrium here. Total labor and the cost of all workers. Now, the cost here is, of course, going to equal the wage of white workers, right? Because for white workers, the only cost of hiring a worker is going to be their wage. But for non white workers, the cost is going to be their wage plus this um, discrimination coefficient, right? So what non-white workers are actually going to get is not going to be this, this white wage, it's going to be this non-white wage, right? So it's going to be the wage minus this D. And the number of non-white workers who are going to be willing to work is going to be here. So we're going to have L star NW here and L star W Okay, so what are we saying? What we're saying is that in the labor market equilibrium, the wage gap between white and non-white workers is equal to D for the reasons we saw before. As a consequence of that, even if white and non-white workers are willing to supply the same labor for the same wage, because non-white workers are being offered a lower wage, they're going to supply less labor than do white workers. In other words, we're going to see lower levels of employment among non-white employees and we're going to see lower levels of wages among non-white non employees. And in the labor market equilibrium, right, the prevailing wage is going to be based on the availability of white and non-white workers and the size of this discrimination. The bigger this discrimination is, the lower the perceived labor supply is going to be to workers because the larger the um, negative cost that they perceive for the, the larger the, um, the premium is that they'd have to pay in order to get non-white workers. Okay, great. So in the next video, we're going to think about what happens if we don't have employers that are all equally prejudiced, right? So when we say all employers are equally prejudiced, they all have some discrimination coefficient D, then the wage gap between white and non-white workers is going to have to equal D. What happens when we've got some workers who have lots and lots of prejudice and some workers who are not very prejudiced at all?